Thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. It's really a pleasure to have this conversation. Um, I'm going to be talking about a course that um, Arizona State University let me uh, develop. It's based on my dissertation research. Um, and the, the award that it won was um, the Aspen Institute Ideas Worth Teaching Award for Business and Society for Curriculum Innovation that tra Transforms Business Education. Um, and you'll see, I think, why it won the award as, it gets, um, as we get going. Uh, so uh, to start out, the, so the course is resource allocation and organizations, and I came across this research, which I think really sets the stage for why a course like this is needed. So this is research that was done in 2021 by OECG, um, a, 500 man, a survey of 500 managers um, asking about their experiences and ideas about ESG reporting. And when they came to, you know, talking about, well, what kind of impact does ESG have on your firm? Um, they said, well, yes, it's clearly um, important to our brand, but there was less um, in, uh, understanding about how ESG supports the financial. And for me, the light that went on is, well, if they don't understand that reputation affects financial, like there's a piece missing. And I realize that's the integrative thinking, right, that we promote. So um, uh, when I came to ASU in 2016, uh, the course existed already, resource allocation and organizations, but it was using a finance book. Um, and I was a little aghast when I looked into the book. It um, uncritically proclaims uh, very confidently cash flow is what matters and the purpose of a firm is to maximize shareholder wealth um, without critically examining any of those statements. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe the story, there's more to the story. Uh, so I, they allowed me to adapt the course, um, now using a multiple capitals perspective. Um, and instead of using textbook, um, I use readings uh, for each module, and I'm happy to share my syllabus with what those readings are. Um, but originally, this course was developed at the undergraduate level for online students in an organizational leadership degree. Um, it's a condensed format, seven and a half weeks, so I spread it over seven modules. Uh, there's an average of 30 students per class, and most of them are working adults with some work experience, uh, military, and then a lot of Starbucks students because of the, our partnership with them. Um, and then in each module, um, it, we talk about what the capital is, how it creates value, how it can be developed, and how it can be measured and tracked. And then the final unit is linking all the capitals together, how they can be deployed strategically. Um, so in unit one, we open with why study resources. I'm not assuming anybody knows what a resource is. So we define it as something of value that helps um, you to achieve a goal. And then talk about tangible and intangible. And then also capital is a special type of resource because of its generative and enduring properties. Um, and then we explain resources being essential to goal attainment. So that's why everybody's so interested in them. Um, and then also, though, there's a social aspect to it, which is the, you know, that resources are closely linked to power. People who have more resources have more agency, the ability to exert and achieve their, what they want out of life. And also having resources now makes it easier to secure resources in the future. So an increasing returns. Um, and then honing in that resources are always ethical decisions um, because everyone needs resources to survive and thrive, but allocation choices usually benefit some more than others. So how to ensure equity in that decision making. Uh, also framing budgets as value statements, what we think is worth investing in, and that um, ethical deployment promotes accountability and legitimacy um, and social license to operate. Uh, so we do start out in week one with financial counting, because I think that's a language everybody uh, can, should be able to speak, um, going over vocabulary and concepts, financial statements, budgeting, and then differentiating managerial and financial accounting. Um, the activity they do is they all pre prepare a simple uh, cash flow statement and a balance sheet. Um, and then in the discussion board, I ha have them talk about um, introducing themselves, but also then what are three resources that you value in your life? And typically they say things like time, they're, they're very stretched for time, um, their family, uh, the library resources, um, but 
uh, then in, to start unit two, I ask them, well, how many of those things that you listed in module one show up on a balance sheet? Um, and then the light goes on, oh, well, you know, we're missing something here. Uh, so that sets us up to week two, which is, you know, an overview of social accounting. What is it? Why is it important beyond financial uh, accounting? And then the, the different types of frameworks that are available, like GRI, SASB, uh, how it relates to CSR and ESG. And then the rest of the class, I really focus on integrated reporting because that's my preferred type of social accounting. Um, and so we, I introduced them to the octopus model, um, the, uh, looking at resource inputs, out, uh, the business model has transformed them into outputs, outcomes, and impact. And if you do it strategically, then they can recycle back to become new inputs. Um, and then we also, in this unit, um, talk about the, uh, introduce them to externalities. Um, and so organizations put outputs into the uh, operating environment for better and worse. Um, and as an, our inter globalized, uh, interconnected and inter interdependent work, uh, world, we're starting to realize that garbage out is now becoming garbage in. So, um, and then the activity, uh, Mary, I think you like this, is um, I give them a case study, this a short article from about Western Union um, and how it's survived over the last 160 years and now is innovating, really putting multi multicultural um, at the forefront of its operations and decision making. And their assignment then is to create an octopus model. So here's two of the, the better ones that I've seen. And um, I... Uh, they, this one is probably the hardest thing because they, they haven't learned about the capitals yet. They're just trying to identify them. So I point them to some of Mary's resources about how to do an inventory of capitals um, and teasing that out from the article. Um, and then here's another example. Uh, I don't care if they're handwritten or not. I actually think there's a lot of advantage cognitively to drawing things. Um, but they, it's the point is that they're thinking about resources as inputs being transformed and outputs and then flowing back into the organization. Um, so they, you know, struggle with this one, but, but they enjoy it. Um, the next week we get into human and natural capital. Um, and I have to say that this is one of my biggest surprises teaching the course. I thought students, the younger generation, would be more um, well-versed in um, ecology and natural capital, but I'm finding that's not the case at all. They don't know what it is. Um, and so the first thing to teach them is that humans are part of nature, so we're embedded in that we're... And then also, um, I, this is the typology that I developed from my research and I uh, differentiate, I, I scroll down into the different aspects of the different types of capitals, um, because as a manager, these are leverage points that you can do things to activate these different types of capital. So creative capital, for example. Um, and, and then in human capital, then we talk about the different dimensions, psychological, creative, moral, physiological. And um, let's see, what else? Uh, and the case study we use here is um, Google's Project Aristotle. I don't know if you've um, seen it. It's a research they did on teams, what makes a high performing team. And they thought they were gonna find, oh, like the smartest engineers, the smartest people. And what they they really found out was no, that it's not about intelligence. It's about um, this uh, construct called psychological safety. And so are people safe to vo uh, voice difference of opinion? Um, and to um, say things without being criticized or shot down, which shuts down a flow of information and ideation. Uh, and so that uh, teamwork uh, and, and the importance of the psychological dimension is um, then sets the stage. Oh, first we'll get into, we also cover natural capital. Um, and here, you know, talking about it as the source of all resources, the stock of um, uh, ecosystem resources that yield a flow of valuable goods, so the notion that resources flow, and then that natural capital has the capacity to regenerate um, because many of the resources are renewable, um, and then go into some of the services that nature provides for us, like pollination and erosion prevention. Uh, and then we talk about um, this framework and the Millennium Development Goals talked about um, ecosystem services. 
Uh, so they divided into four uh, services categories that nature provides supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural. And then uh, the students really like this graphic too, that just does give a very visual representation of, oh yes, nature does help us. <laughs> um, and then how does it create value for the firm here? Uh, we've you've switched more to the firm level. So talking about increasingly shareholders are wanting uh, information about natural capital. So it's a, 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 a way to attract financial capital. Uh, and then also the disruption of ecosystem services because of the loss of biodiversity and other, um, you know, global uh, climate change. Um, and but then it also showing it as a business opportunity um, because you can use it either to reduce costs, um, increase efficiency, um, manage and ex enhance your reputational um, and uh, mitigate risk, and then also a way to develop new products and services. Uh, and then, you know, how can it be developed? Um, the literature that I found, you know, talks about three basic ways. Um, one is strategy, developing these new markets and understanding the green market um, through management operations, uh, responsible procurement and sourcing uh, and green infrastructure, and then reporting to let um, stakeholders know, um, you know, how are you deploying it responsibly? And McKinsey and CGMA have put out some good reports on this. Uh, and then we get into uh, measuring natural capital, just a very simple uh, example. This is from Cecil's, I think 2018 integrated report of metrics that they use. Uh, but the overarching thing of the importance of tracking inputs, tracking outputs, mapping and illustrating and understanding the interdependencies of, um, within natural capital, and then also how those relate to the other capitals, and then developing strategies to uh, address environmental challenges and how that enabled you to leverage market opportunities. Um, then in week four, we get into um, social capital. Um, and here again, uh, I was surprised. I thought students might have a, a more intuitive understanding, but it's a shock to them that relationships, you know, provide resources to us. Um, and so things like a sense of belonging, feelings of trust and safety, values and norms, um, voluntary association, and then also I put diversity in this category. And then also introducing them to the concept of level. So social capital doesn't just happen, you know, among teams or, or dyads people, uh, uh, two people, but um, also, you know, you have within your organization and then among organizations and nations, um, societies. Um, and then getting into how does it create value? Um, and then here again, we talk about value created at the micro level, which is um, you know, people and organizations, uh, such as increasing access to information, more diverse information, um, increasing capacity to influence others, um, developing uh, shared identity and a sense of connection, and then enhanced reputation personally um, through as you build trust with others. And then at the macro, I'm talking about uh, this notion of social cohesion. Um, and how through, you know, trustworthy relationships, you create a, a container of, of stability and a, a structure that uh, in, allows for enduring and sustained economic exchange. Um, but the key to this then is reciprocity, uh, which we talk about in the next uh, slide. So how, how you exchange resources with others really matters. Um, do you do it in a way that um, is reciprocal where benefits are being exchanged equitably among all parties? Or do you do it in an extractive process um, through things like suboptimal competition or information asymmetry where you're really taking advantage of others? Um, and the, the problem with that latter is it erodes norms of trust. Um, and at the collective level, it reduces social cohesion and increases social polarization and ultimately systemic risk. Um, so really um, pointing out that reciprocity reciprocal exchange is very important. Um, and then I also do introduce them to complexity theory. I find this is um, a really important concept for them to understand how do micro level interactions um, exchange among individuals and organizations create this macro 
Um, and it's, it's through a process called emergence uh, where micro interactions can create a qualitative state change. Um, the notion of birds flying and turning into a flock is one example of emergence, uh, how the pattern forms, um, not because some bir other bird is imposing order, but through these um, autonomous interactions, a, a new uh, order format emerges. Uh, let's see. And then uh, the case study we use for this unit is um, the how did Amazon or how did independent bookstores reinvent themselves in the face of disruption by Amazon. Um, and this I draw on research out of Harvard by Raffaelli and he talks about three C's of uh, curation community or and convening he doesn't use the word social capital, uh, but it clearly is. Um, and then I also like this article because it talked about the American Booksellers Association um, play, playing a really important role, um, brokering and networking among the bookstores to create this network effect. So the students just love this article. Um, and then I won't, don't have time to get into it now. I wanna leave time for our discussion, but in my model, I also have two additional categories, um, structural capital and symbolic capital. So Symbolic, um, this is where intellectual capital lives. So things like um, intellectual property um, and patents, um, organizational culture, uh, reputation. Um, and then I also include space and time as resources. So space, you think about car dealerships or um, innovation hubs as an example of, of space, uh, the you know space, spatial proximity being turned into a resource and same as time. Um, and then for structure, this kind of gets into the um, things that Mary calls internalities. Um, how do, the decisions the organization makes about how it structures itself, um, like whether a hierarchy or a matrix um, organizational model, um, the processes it uses, such as communication, um, data collection, uh, and learning is a big one. That, so we do go into learning organizations. Um, and then we get into governance, um, which in the literature and capitals is called rule of law um, by DeSoto. Um, and then, you know, how governance, good governance, you know, prevents um, cronyism and nepotism and corruption and also ensures compliance. Um, so collectively, when you put all the capitals together, this is in my model that, that I use um, what they look like. And here again, um, the, the, the six categories, but uh, scrolling down in each one because they are actionable um, at a lower level. Let's see. And then um, getting into um, systems thinking and how integrated reporting promotes integrated thinking. Um, and it connects values, strategy, actions, and metrics in a way to help the organization achieve its goals. Um, it accounts for stakeholders' values and perspectives, and it considers um, long-term value creation and generative capacity over time. Um, and so the, the metaphor I use with the students in the final module is thinking about resources or capitals as energy. So just like um, energy capitals flow, and they can be strategically um, activated and converted. So thinking about programs or business activities, business models as transforming potential energy into kinetic energy, um, which we see as the different forms of capital. Um, and then the one thing, you know, I really want to bring to this group's attention, and I spend time on it in my class as well, is the idea that this capitals framework is translatable across levels, right? So you could use it personally, you know, how do you develop your personal power? Um, organizations, of course, to create long-term value uh, for, society, for the firm and society. But this, these, this, a similar framework called the community capitals framework is also used in, um, uh, community and rural economic development is sort of where it got its start. Um, but the, and now, for example, the uh, uh, Alameda Sheriff's uh, Office, county office is using uh, multiple capitals as a way to think about community policing and how do they police more holistically and, and um, you know, with a stakeholder orientation. And um, this level, this community level is really important because you know, so many companies I see in their integrated reports, they do talk about the SDGs, 
but without linking it to the regional action and the localizing the, the SDGs through community capitals, it's really a missing link. And so um, I position, you know, integrated reporting, my modified model as a way to link these different levels. Um, and then I wanted to let you know, what do the students think about this course? Because I'm doing some research on like mindset shifts. And so one of the most common uh, responses I get is, um, wow, I never knew so many resources um, at, or are at our disposal. So it, that's a little bit of a shock. And then some people, they're very hopeful. Wow, this is, you know, gives me a lot more options. And then I've had a few people actually get angry um, because they go, how did I get to be this age? And no one ever talked to me about social capital or natural capital. I'm like, well, I don't know, but here we are. So um, I, thought, I thought that was funny. Um, and then just helping them make sense of workplace dynamics. Oh, now I understand why my company does the things that it does. Um, and then this last quote, it comes from a chief petty officer who out, was out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, he, uh, and he said, um, the course has given me language and a framework to explain the things I've been doing intuitively, um, but now I can do them more systematically and intentionally. Um, and so the key takeaway of the, for the students is that, you know, an economy rooted in reciprocity depends on resources, and these can be uh, created endogenously, right, within the organization. We don't have to go over it and go out and try to control resources. There's a lot we can do, like through culture and social capital, uh, to create them ourselves. Um, they can be converted through strategy um, and monetized um, in ways that return benefits both to the organization and uh, to society and other stakeholders. And um, by doing it in this way, you increase prosperity and the generative capacity of the firm and society in the short, medium, and long term. Um, and I'll close with this quote from Rumi. Um, it says, you think because you understand one, that you also understand two, because one and one makes two, uh, but you must also understand and. Um, and so I see that as the beauty of integrated reporting is it is, a, you know, shining a light on and. So that's it for the slides. I guess we can open it up for questions now.